Everybody knows who I am, pretty much. Yeah, there's a couple people here that just met me. Glad to see you folks. And I'm glad to see anybody else that's here that doesn't usually come here because you know what? You're supposed to be here. You know, I was, I was born and raised right here, Shippensburg. I'm an old Shippensburg boy. And uh, oh, I didn't, I, I, I was a country boy. I mean, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was bad to the bone. At least I thought it was, you know. I uh, did a lot of crazy stuff around here. And some of the older police officers could have told you a whole, whole, whole book on me. Uh, you know, I was in, and I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip all that. Because that's that's not that doesn't have anything to do with what God did for me, in the wind up. You know, I was in an industrial accident in '79. Broke my back. Started a long, long road of bouncing in and out of the hospital, all kinds of drugs. You know, I got so tired of being down that I decided I wanted to be up. And so enters methamphetamine. I played with it for several years until I ended up in Texas in the early 80s. And I was, I mean, it, it was like I was doing about a gram and a half, anywhere from $125 to $150 a day. I mean, and I was IV in it. I was, you know, I've still got a few scars. They're, they're pretty much de dilapidated into the skin now. But I shot, you know, I shot up three, four, five, six times a day. And I mean, you know, like I didn't ever want to be down again. So I stayed racing all the time. Went to work for people that I could make money. You know. Um, I did a lot of different things when I was down there. I was a mechanic for a while, was a painter for a while, a carpenter for a while, and then a collector for a long while. Uh, a lot of people have heard me say this, that, that's, you know, here in the church and, and have heard me speak before, that for a guy who used to hurt people for a living, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you know, even on my bad, my worst day, I'm doing pretty good. You know, the, there's a lot, there's a lot that I could tell you about that. But I'm not going to have to. Because I'm going to tell you about the end. You know, we're talking in 1984. I'd already been strung out for three years. And I was in a near fatal motorcycle accident. I T-boned a car head on. He pulled out. I go, no, and the car had stalled. I could have got by if he wouldn't have started up and pulled forward again. He started up, pulled forward, and I hit him. The whole right-hand side of my motorcycle was gone. I still have my leg. Lost a bunch of muscles, but I still got my leg in the hospital, come out, end up in, end up in, a, in another hospital up in Dallas. Talk to this doctor and specialized in addiction. And I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, and I mean, the, the cops took me there. I was barefooted. Now, this is no joke. Middle of summer, we're in Dallas, Texas. It's 110 in the shade, folks. This is, you know, when it hits a heat wave, it, it gets that hot. So here I am. I'm, I'm in there. I'm talking to this guy. There's all these people in this room laying all over the floor and stuff, you know. And, and I don't know if you've ever been around anybody that's, that's been strung out on methamphetamine for a while, but it stinks like old stale urine. Yeah, I said it right. And it's not a pretty smell or a pretty sight. Because I felt, you know, I, you know, here I am, my clothes are hanging on me, wearing a T-shirt, 
and you can see the bones in my shoulders. And I'm a big guy. I got big bones. So, I mean, you know, like, I, pretty, I look pretty ridiculous. This guy, you know, he's, he's in there and he's talking to me. He said, well, you ought to be in a, you ought to be, you know, an inpatient, yada, yada, yada. And I said, look, I said, all my stuff's probably sitting along the street somewhere in DeSoto. I said, it's everything I have. All I wanted to do is get back to DeSoto so I could do another fix, you know. It is what it was, you know. That's, that's the way I thought about it. And God left me do it. The guy looked at me and he said, well, I don't care if you quit today or tomorrow. You'll never make it to 45. I was, uh, you know, like, okay, I was uh, 30, 31. He said, you'll never make it to 45. He said, you'll, you'll die from the damage you've done to your body right now. I just celebrated my 71st birthday last, this past August 1st. You know, it, it, God, God has a way of, of rejuvenating us. You know, I don't want to get ahead of my story here. So I walked. <laughs> he, he turned me loose. And I walked back to DeSoto, except for about 20, 25 miles. Along the interstate, my feet had blisters that were a half an inch deep and about three inches long on both my feet. And I took my t-shirt off and I ripped it and I wrapped my feet up just so I could walk. Nobody picked me up because I didn't have a shirt on. <laughs> you know, so here I am, you know, I didn't know which way to go, but I, I just kept, uh, and you know, like you get out there and I don't know if anybody's been addicted to a bunch of stuff like that or not, but you start talking to God and, and trying to make deals with him. Okay, I'm never, this, this is some, some of the stuff I've never, I've never admitted to anybody. I'm walking along the highway. God, if you'll just get me a ride, I'll do this or I'll do that. And it was, it was terrible. I mean, I hurt. You know, I had no joy. I couldn't breathe good. But I got back to DeSoto. One of the cops picked me up that knew me. He says, let's go find your car, your truck. So we went and found my pickup. I knew where the motorcycle was. It was in the junkyard. And he found my pickup. So I got in my pickup. And I went to a friend's place. And I got cleaned up some, you know. And they, they helped doctor my feet. I started sleeping in a car, in a car wash. I'd pull in the car wash after they'd close. I'd ride around, you know, and, and go out in the country and, and boot up, you know, and then, and then ride around town and everything. And when the car wash would close, the guy would pull the front door down, so I'd pull in the back and I'd go to sleep. The guy that owned it caught me one night, about 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, I heard somebody was down here. I said, man, I don't need a place to go right now because I'm working on it. He said, well, just make sure you're out of here before the attendant comes in in the morning. See, God gave me a pass. Things were starting to change. So here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm still all busted up. I'm still walking on crutches. I'm doing, you know, after this accident. You know, all these things just kept, kept, I kept hitting that wall. Did you ever just get so fed up with just running into that same old wall? Just going boom, and boom. You know, accident after accident, hurt after hurt. I mean, you know, you, you walk out of a restaurant and you take a step wrong and you fall and you got a concussion. All these things happened to me. And it was just my own stupidity. But you know, I, these are the heights of my addiction. I mean, I, my, you know, like I had been married... I took, I, I took my wedding ring and, and took it to my dealer and said, hey, will you give me a gram for this? Well, the ring was probably worth four or 500 bucks. A gram back then cost $100. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I, that's how desperate I was. You know, I had got to the point, nobody would hire me, nobody would give me a job. 
I was, I had lost everything. There was nothing left. There was nothing left in here. Nothing left in here. That's whenever you, that's, that's whenever you know that the end's near. I wanted to die. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I asked God, I said, why don't you just take me? You know, I, I, I was just in a stupor. I went, to, I went to a church called the Church of Christ. And uh, they don't believe in music. It's kind of weird. They'll sing, but they don't believe in instruments and stuff. But I, I was there, and, and this gentleman came up to me. That's how God works, folks. He came up to me, barring all the bad stuff. He didn't care. All he knew is he saw somebody that was hurting. And there's a lot of love in that, in that church. So they might not believe the way we do, but they, 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 they believe it. love. They believe in the love. They're, they're like, a, like the Nazarenes. Nazarenes are the same way. This thing keeps sliding back. Sorry, folks. It's hard for me to stand on this one leg right now. But uh, he, he said, hey, he said, when did you eat last? I said, I don't know. I didn't. I mean, I, I didn't even have a place to take a shower. I'm just, I'm doing, you know, sponge baths in the in the, uh, in the lab in the bathrooms and the convenience store and the gas stations. You know, uh, I'm sure I looked a sight. But he says, "Here," he said, uh, "I want you to take this." He said, and "Then I want you to go up." And he gave me the name of a motel. And he said, "I want you to go to this motel." And he said, I'm going to call them right now. So I went up, and they, they said, here's a key. So, you know, like, I'm going like, wow. Now I, got to, I don't have to go out in the country to boot up. It's like, okay, and this is crazy. You know, so I got something to eat. I got meals and wheels for me. Here I am, I'm recuperating, trying to get my life together. And I keep sliding back down the tube every day. I met this guy. His name was Jim Wilkerson. Uh, I haven't seen him in years. But I'm going to use his name anyway. It doesn't matter. He wouldn't care. That's the kind of guy he was. Uh, you know, if he was, if he was willing to come and, and get me and take me to his home with his three sons, as bad a shape as I was in, he, you know, he, he's not going to, he, he's not going to mind me saying his name. But he took me to church. Well, he, he called, he, he, he came. I met him, and then he came over, and then. Then he left, and then he called the motel, and he said, hey, he said, they're having revival over at my wife's church. He said, would you like to go? Because I had told him that I was Church of God, Assemblies of God, stuff like that. Well, that's when I ended up at Blue Grove Assembly of God, in Lancaster, Texas. And, folks, I, I don't know how many, how many people would hug a homeless person. The dirtiest nastiest prayer. How many people here would really do it? Can you really say you'd honestly do it? Okay. Okay, that's, that's the love of God. Because I I walked in that church and there's a line of people and they're all hugging me. I was yellow. I'm talking about yellow. Not just a, not just a tint. I'm talking about my skin, my face. My eyes, my eyes look like a yellow crayon. And I was flabbergasted. I know I smelled bad too, man. I mean, you know, whew. I mean, you know, that, that, raunchy. That's the word I can see you use, use to, to describe it, raunchy. And they didn't care. They hugged me anyway. Now I was I'm, now, like I say, I regressed. I was raised in these churches. I mean, you know, I, I I attended my first foot washing at ten years old. You know, it was something that you just did. 
and hugging someone that was in such a bad way as I was, it was something that you just did. So here I am. I mean, you know, I'm still all beat up. I mean, I'm, you know, one day I'm on crutches, the next day I'm not, you know, and it's like, my goodness. You know, the, the, the days were so long. So they prayed for me. They brought me up front. I'll never forget the, the pastor's name. His, pa it was, it was, his name was Pastor Pope. Uh, we always teased him. But he's a big old tall fella, big old tall Texan. Nice as could be. I mean, a gentle giant. And he just loved me. He said, he said we're just going to love you until you can love yourself. And he was acting like I was coming back, you know. So Jimmy took me back, dropped me off, you know, made sure I had, you know, cigarettes, whatever I need, you know. So dropped me off at the, at the motel, and I went back the second night. He, he says, we're going tomorrow night, too. Well, you've heard of the term, you knew you'd been weighed and measured. Well, after the second night, I knew I'd been weighed and measured. Because something was happening. There was a spark that was starting to rise up within me. Something that I hadn't felt in a couple of decades. Took me back to the motel after the second night of prayer. I mean, you know, like, it's terrible when you take a shower and you smell just as bad after the shower as what you did before. And that's how I was. I had that much methamphetamine flowing through the capillaries in my body that that's what, that, that's what I smelled like. You couldn't, you, there's nothing I could do to, to stop that odor from coming through. Put the aftershave on, it lasts about 10 minutes, you know. And, and I, was, I was to the point I couldn't shave because it just rolled the skin off with the razor. But that third night, I was ready to go before Jimmy got there. I was pacing, waiting to go because I wanted to see what was going to happen on the other side of that day. I tell people I'm a miracle because I am. I went back to that meeting, that, that church service that night. I don't even know who the, I don't even know who was preaching the revival. I can't remember. Because I didn't have any memory at that time. I didn't have any, I couldn't even read, let alone remember stuff. But I went back. They prayed for me again, and I broke. I'm standing there on crutches, and I broke. Folks, you ever see somebody just drop? I'm not talking about just like that. I'm talking about just straight down, like as if they imploded a building, straight down. It felt like every bone in my body had come apart. Sure it had. I was about to be remade. I don't know how long I was on the floor. Finally, they got me up and got me sitting. And I knew that I knew that I knew that something was entirely different. You know, and there, with that spark of fire, there started to be a little bit of joy started to grow. When that joy started to grow inside me, My heart started to beat normal because it always beat fast because of all the drugs. And at that point, when I got back to the motel, Jimmy said, you're going to be all right? You're going to be all right? I said, yeah, I'll be fine. Little did he know 
that I was headed into my room to grab all my stuff and take it out. Now, this, you, you guys have seen these great big tall dumpsters. They're about eight foot tall or ten. They got doors that slide on them and they lock them at night whenever they're not going to be dumping them. Well, I had everything in a pouch. I, I mean, I was meticulous. I, I would buy the crystal meth, I would break it down, and then I'd put it in the vial. Draw it up, put it in the vial. I had it all ready. All I had to do was bang, and I was off to the races. I took all that stuff. And I went out there, and I'm going, I, you know, imagine David with the slingshot, right? Well, I just up over, and I heard it hit the bottom. They had just emptied the dumpster, so guess what? Uh, there was no way I was getting it back. I looked, I looked up into the stars and I said, okay, God. If all this that I've been hearing and feeling is real, then there's one of two things going to happen. I'm going to walk through this with you or I'll die tonight. You don't. I don't know how much anybody knows about this, but you don't just cut off taking crystal meth. And your IV and stuff and your mainline and drugs, you don't just quit. You don't just stop. You don't just throw it away and just say, okay, I'm done. No, it don't work that way. I went back in to the motel room. And I passed out on the floor. And when I woke the next morning, I didn't know if I'd wake up or not. When I woke up the next morning, I was looking around. I, I went like this to see if I could hear gnashing of teeth, stuff like that. Or was I, did, I hear, did I hear angels singing? I didn't hear nothing. Nothing. I was still there. I was still in my body. I thought I'd, I thought I'd done died and went to heaven or hell. I mean, it, it wouldn't have much mattered at that point, as, as miserable as, as I was, which one, as long as I didn't have to put up with what I was doing anymore. When you get to that point, it's a pretty sad place to be. It really is. It's not any fun. But I stood up. And I looked at my arms. My arms were yellow, but they weren't anymore. They were just as white and clear as a newborn baby's skin. I went into the bathroom, and my eyes were white, and the blue was blue again. All of these things happened in one night. He did it in one night. One night. I was free. I wasn't shaken. I was hungry. I hadn't ate a decent meal in over three years. I needed sustenance. Took a shower. Didn't stink anymore. Put on a clean t-shirt. We had to throw the old t-shirt and pants and underwear and everything away because they were saturated with all of that poison that leached out of my body while I was passed out on the floor. And that's when God started the newness in Rob Hudson. Because, you know, Jesus died for me. Because he knew back around 1984, 1985, I was going to need him really, really bad. And he answered the call. When you make that call and it's answered, you know, there's, there, there's just, it's wild. At that point, I knew... I was going to be okay. I knew I had to fight on my hands. 
I didn't know it was going to be okay. The guy that had sent me to the motel called me that next day. He said, how are you doing? I said, I got to tell you all about this. He said, well, I'll be back. Home. He worked for IBM. He was the head representative for an IBM corporation from Mississippi to California. And he said, I'll be back in by Saturday. Saturday morning we'll have breakfast and we'll talk about this. Folks, I, I got all this here. and I, You know what? I just want to tell you what God gave me to, for you. He took me out of that motel, put me in a little A-frame house, two-bedroom A-frame, nothing in it, little garage, set me up to, to start working on some cars here and there. We started a landscaping company, so his, his one boy, his one boy wasn't, uh, you know, he, he, was, he wasn't big school thing. He, he wanted to get out there, you know, he was muscle man. So we started the landscape business. We did all of this. I told him, I said, I don't have anything to wear, hardly. You know. He said, don't worry about it. He said, God will take care of it. We went to work. That, uh, that next week, he, had, he took a week off to help me get started with using a dirt box and stuff like that with the tractor and all. And uh, we, we get back from work. We come down the hill, you'd, you'd come across the parking lot, and it was right behind the church his house was. And as we came down the driveway towards my driveway, my truck <laughs> was sitting there in the driveway, and in the back of the truck, the back of the truck was bowed up to the cab with goods and stuff to, to, to start my new life. The inside of, this, inside of the cab was full of clothing. And, and, you know, and, and the envelopes. And I open these envelopes and there's these, there's these money cards and there's, you know, there's cash. And, and it's like, how? Why? I didn't remember, you know. I didn't know. And I went back, I want to regress once here. Before he took me out of there, I met this old Baptist preacher. And I know that a lot of people like to hear this part. I couldn't read. I couldn't read a word. This old Baptist preacher had made me coffee many times while, you know, that my stay there. And we're talking a course of a couple of months here. These people kept me in a motel for a couple of months. Meals and wheels, all of that. So I could get stronger. Well, I went upstairs, uh, you know, hobbled up there and he made coffee and we're sitting there and he hands me a Bible. I still have it at the house. I was going to bring it and I forgot. But he handed me this Bible. I said, I said, Reverend, I can't read. He said, what do you mean you can't read? I said, I, I said, I've fried so much in my brain, I can't read. He said, sure you can. He said, I got one, one thing to tell you. Read the red stuff. Read the red stuff. The words of Christ. Where's our healing come from, folks? The blood of Jesus. The stripes. See, he told me, he says, read the red stuff. In six months, I was reading, I was reading uh, with about 80% comprehension. In a year, it was... Well, I, I was up over 100% comprehension. I didn't know that they actually went any higher, but it, it, it was. I was. I was doing really well. In fact, I even took classes at Christ for the Nations. But, you know, it's, those thresholds that I'm talking about were all because I sought, and I'm so glad that Mary said stuff, the stuff she did, because I sought peace I needed peace when the first thing that happens whenever you inject yourself with methamphetamine is your heart starts to jump 
and then, you know, your breathing quickens. Your head spins a little bit. And then you get this euphoric state where you feel like you can whip the world or run the fastest mile and all of this stuff. See, that had all gone away. But I found a new euphoria. His name is Jesus Christ. He opened up so many doors. And there's something else that that Mary brought to my mind when she was sharing, and Brother Chad too. And it, and it comes from the book of Proverbs. It's 18, Proverbs 18, 20 and 21. The KGV says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall, be, shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That's one of the first things I learned. <clears throat> Do I get it right? No, I don't always get it right. Did I get this whole thing right? No, absolutely not. I fell down. I did. I, I mean, I skinned my knees, you know, spiritually. My spiritual knees were were busted up more times than what I even want to think about because my lover was the world. Jesus was my savior, but my lover was still the world. It took a while. Pastor's always telling us, you don't have to wait to get everything cleaned up to come to Jesus. Come to him and he'll help you get it cleaned up. He'll clean that mess up. He's a, he, he, I, I, and I, a lot of people won't like when I say this, but Jesus is the best janitor I ever knew. He's, he's, he, he's cleaned this whole thing here out so many times and set my feet back on the rock where it's supposed to be. It's, you know, and that's the only way that I can really describe it because it's a truth. I mean, you know, like I, I, you know, I got tired of playing monkey in the middle. You know, I, you know, like my miracle had just happened. God gave me more than I ever had. What I lost was nothing compared to what he gave me. He sent me through places that I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine. And I identified. <clears throat> as I started learning more and more and more because you have to be re, I had to be retaught a lot of the a lot of the childhood memories were repressed so deep that until I got to a point <clears throat> excuse me until I got to a point where I could you know really sit and think and meditate on what was going on. So I got there, you know, like all that was, all that was just kind of buried. I still think, of, I still remember stuff today from my teens and stuff that I hadn't remembered in years. It still comes back. It still comes in waves, you know. Hey, I'll, I'm all for it. I love it because whenever it happens, I go, wow, I wonder, I wonder what they're doing now. Well, nowadays, you know, and then I start looking for somebody. I look them up, you know, on the Internet or something, you know, Facebook, whatever. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, my, my favorite, one of my favorite, one of my favorites. <laughs> I have a lot of favorite passages in the Bible. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, folks. Uh but I, I do want to, uh, it's Luke 15, 11 through 32. It's the story of the prodigal son. I identified. And, you know, and I, you know, it's like, here's the boy. And he said, but when he finally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have enough food while I'm dying here of hunger? Oh, that's better. I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. <clears throat> Just treat me like one of your hired men. 
So he got up and came to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with passion, compassion for him. Hmm. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the, to the servants, quickly, bring our best robe for our guest of honor. And put it on him. And give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. And bring the fatted calf. And slaughter it. And let us invite everyone and feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was as good as dead, but he's alive again. He was lost and has been found. So they began to celebrate. I, I, I see that because a lot of that happened to me. The things I just told you that God brought in, brought to me, you know, that, I don't know, it made a stone if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't help you, if it doesn't get you. It got me, and I was made a stone at one time. You know, and, you know, like, my next one is Ephesians 6, 11 through 20. And that's the armor of God. My favorite part of that is it says here, and it says, and all things through prayer and supplication. And, you know, and, and it talks about standing. And also you've heard me talk about when Paul, and this is Paul's writing, of course, and it says for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. I got that twinge this morning when Pastor was saying, I don't know everything about this. It's a mystery. That went through my head. It's a mystery. I don't know about that, all that about that either, but I'm sure going to keep on working until I find out. You know, because it's not, it's not something that we just, we don't just come across this stuff. It just don't pop up in front of us and make us feel better. We have to find that. You know, and, and a lot of people also heard me say, I gotta quit saying that, but Peter had to cast the net. He had to cast the net. We have to take a step forward. I was, a, word, a word was given to me back here by my brother one day. It was a Sunday night. Two, two first Sunday nights ago. And he said, Imagine a, a safe, and uh, all you have to do is pull the handle and open the door. It's time. Then he gets up here and talks about time again tonight. It's time. That season, you know, it's time to move on. It's time to, it's time to really get out and do it. And I think that's for all of us, folks. You know, when those people at Blue Grove Assembly of God in Lancaster, Texas, when they called me sober and I was alcohol-free and drug-free, at that moment, God did for me what nobody else could. They spoke. They spoke. They prophesied. Prosperity into me. Now, prosperity is not just money. Prosperity is health, you know, okay. Wellness, health and wellness, you know, spirituality, you know. Yeah, money, we all like to have a little money. But, you know, that's the thing. They, they prophesied that into me, you know. And, you know, as the, as the Holy Spirit has worked in me, You know, I found I found a joy that I I don't think I could ever let go of. People say, "Well, we don't see you around sometimes." I say, "Well, that don't mean that I'm anywhere else but where I'm supposed to be. I'm still in the grace of God." 
my body, you know, uh, my body's a, a pro probably a product of my own being. I've done a lot of stuff that I probably shouldn't have done. God's healed me many times. And, I, every, and every, time that, uh, every time that I get at and I start doing something like this, the devil tries to come against me. Well, I won't let him. Because I'm not going back to that addictive state. Because I was taught to stand by God's word. And whenever, he, whenever, whenever Jesus said in, in, the, uh, in the book of John, 1426, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So guess what? You know, he didn't let us down. We leave him down more often than what we, what, uh, what uh, you know, we can imagine. Because God, will, uh, he won't let us down. He's not a man that he should lie. And there's one, one, there's one passage that I really want to share. And it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days. This is, this is Peter's first sermon, actually. Um, he's, he's quoting um, uh, the, from the book of Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams yeah I know all about that and my servants and on my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall prophesy you know I I try to walk in the you know with the Lord every day and I've, I've asked God many times, God, what, why? Why me? What do I, how do I deserve all this? You know, I, I'll tell you, that's some pretty bad stuff. I mean, I, I, you know, I shot at people, broke legs. I did a lot of bad stuff to people. I've always been a big boy. You know, anywhere from 250 to 300, you know, and then when my addiction hit me hard, and then I was down about 130 or less. And, uh, you know, it was all a bag of bones. But, you know, I've asked God, what do you want me to do? And he came to me one night in a dream, and he, he told me, he said, why don't you teach my people how to be free? He said, teach them how to loose the chains of bondage. Share what I did for you. You're, you know, your place is ready. He just wants me to tell you about it. Pray with you. I'm going to tell you something. There's freedom. There's freedom. Mary knows it. Pastor knows it. There's freedom. You know it. I just got a witness all over me. And I was guilty of having that as an addiction. I needed to be accepted. Darn it. You know? Now the only thing that I get upset about is... Okay, God, God, this is God. God made this for me. I want it. It's mine, and that's okay, because we're supposed to be that way. We're supposed to boldly. It says to go boldly before the Lord. I mean, I'm I, I'm guilty of, of taking my Bible when something's really really bad. I take my Bible, put it on the floor, and stand on it. They say, stand on the word. I do, literally. <laughs> literally. But it works. Folks, it works. I'm, I mean, you know, everybody, they, they, they look at me. I mean, my neighbors, I'm sure my neighbors think that I'm, I'm insane or something. Because I'm over there dancing around in the spirit, you know, with my cane, you know. And I, 
you know, knocking stuff over, and the cat, he runs and hides, and, you know, and it's like, I've had a prayer meeting this past week, folks. The wife's out of town. She, she's, you know, she's gone till December. So, you know, it's like, um, I don't have her to pray for me. So I thought, well, you know what? I don't have to have her to pray for me. You know, I, I, you know, I don't have to do, well, I mean, you know, like God says, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. There's only one time that you see what you're asking for. And I think we covered this one time in a, in a, in a Bible study on a Wednesday night. And I, I spoke up and I said, when you start to see it in your spirit, the manifestations just around the corner. You're asking God for something. See it in your spirit. I see me walking without a cane. I praise God for that every day. Has it manifested? I don't know. Maybe it's my fault. I don't know. But it's not his will for me to be a cripple. That's for sure. You know? I, I'm, you know I'm just, I'm like anybody else. I, you know, I walk... I try to walk with the Lord every day. And it's not something, in, you know, and addiction is something that you can get rid of, folks. Everybody says, oh, he's hopeless, he's hopeless. No, he's not. He's not hopeless. He's not hopeless. You know, it tells us in Matthew, I'm almost done, folks, but I want to have prayer with you then. It tells us in Matthew 6, on the 25th, 25th verse, it said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body the remnant? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, <clears throat> but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with, them, with all shall we be clothed? It says, and then it skips to the 30, no, it skips to the 30 second. Oh, okay, it jumps right in. For after all these things do Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yo, know, folks, you know, I, I don't know what anybody's told you or taught you. Addiction, they say, is a sickness. Oh, it's also a little bit more than that. It's a spiritual sickness as well. Uh, it's it's a it's a demonic it's a demonic situation that has to be dealt with the right way. I've seen people spend twenty twenty five years in. 12-step programs. Uh, now they're, they're great. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody to go out and say, he's against us here. No, I'm not. But what about after you get to the 12th step? That's why the book that I'm writing is called Addiction Recovery, The Next Step. And it gives all these, all these scriptures and all the paths that I've had to travel. I didn't get it right the first time, folks. I never put another needle in my arm, though, after God delivered me that night. I'd done some other stupid stuff, drank too much, rode too fast, drove too fast, you know, picked up, threw to jail overnight, different stuff like that, you know, over the years. You know, I mean, you know, I'd go whole hog with, you know, with the Bible and the Lord for, you know, for a few months, next thing you know, 
Where's Rob? Back on the street somewhere. You know, and and you know, and it was it was tough. But finally, finally something clicked all the way. We don't always get it right the first time. I'm not saying that you that that you'll have the same problems I did, but you'll find the same answers if you look for them. They're there. He gave them to us. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. It's our roadmap, our dictionary for life. God opens the doors. All we have to do is walk through them. I mean, I walk through this. I I mean, I've, I've pastored churches, I mean, you know, temporarily and stuff like that. I met, I met Pastor Tim here at my brother's church. I was associate pastor and song leader. And, and you know, and uh, I had been, I had taken that church for six months while my brother was recuperating. Another church for six months before that. But I didn't really feel at home to walk through the doors back there. Well, the old doors were there then. But I, when I walked in there, I'm, I'm, I just, I mean, I, if you'd have been beside me and heard the sigh, it's like I went, <sighs> like all, all of the harshness and stuff that had said, been said about me, to me, everything was gone. See, you can try to fill a church up with people like me, and they most likely won't stay. But if God brings them in, they'll stay. They'll be here. They'll, 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 they'll be here for, you know. I mean, I, I'm home. I was, God, was, God was enlightening me this week. Here I am. I'm going, my God, I don't know anybody else. You're my family. You're all I got. You are my family. Marcy feels the same way. I don't have, I, I mean, I, I've got a brother and a sister and a half sister and a couple of kids, but they don't help feed me. We feed each other, folks. We feed each other spiritually. Yes, we do. And, and sometimes we feed each other physically, too. Because, I mean, I mean these, these, these cookouts and, and stuff we have, yeah, that's what families do. They get together and they have a barbecue. That's why I'm here. Am I going to go other places and speak? If God, if, if God opens the doors, yes, I will. I'll go and I'll share. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable now. I mean, well, you, you know, you, most of you know more about me now than what you did before. Uh, a lot of people don't even realize that I was sticking needles into my arm. You know, now I put needles in my legs and my belly and everything else. I mean, you know, I, I take shots for arthritis, shots for of insulin. Well, of course, I haven't had to use any insulin in over a year. Because I watch what I've eaten. I've lost a bunch of weight, too. 